more than 50 years later, we still don't know who did it. An explosion that rocked the city of Portland's government to its core and left a populace wondering what would happen next. Who was responsible? And why? This is a replica of the Liberty Bell. But did you know, the one that currently stands outside of City Hall is actually the second replica to be placed here? It was purchased using donated funds and installed in 1972. And why did it have to replace another? It was approximately 2.55 a.m. The dead of night and the city streets mostly quiet and vacant. Out of nowhere, an explosion rocked the city. It was described as being like a sheet of lightning. Windows on buildings within a three-block radius were damaged. These buildings, right across the street from City Hall, vacated and demolished only a couple years later, had all of their windows obliterated. It was determined the origin point of this explosion was the original Liberty Bell replica that stood next to City Hall, originally installed in May of 1964. Despite its dense structure and a weight of 2,080 pounds, this bell had been blown to pieces by what was described as a dynamite bomb. This also created a hole two feet deep and four feet in diameter in the space directly beneath where the bell once stood. One piece of the bell penetrated the exterior city hall walls and still had enough power to make a quarter inch indentation into a steel safe. And other pieces of the bell had been thrown hundreds of feet away. This was a frighteningly powerful blast that Had it not needed to blow through this thick metal of the bell, who knows how much more destructive it could have been. The damage, understandably, extended to City Hall, and in particular, its rotunda that wraps around its 4th Avenue side entrance, only feet from where the bell was located. Built in 1895, the City Hall sustained numerous cracks and marks to its outside, as well as extensive damage, primarily on the first floor, to its interior. With the fact that it was November, when employees were allowed to return to the building a few days later, they found themselves working in frigid conditions as most of the building's windows had been blown out. Altogether, estimates for the cost to repair City Hall were listed at around half a million dollars. Due to the time in which the explosion occurred, as well as the fact that all the buildings across the street were vacant, awaiting demolition, there were no serious injuries as a result of it. This can lead one to believe that those responsible did not wish to actually hurt anyone while still sending a jarring message to the public, as well as those in power in the city. There was only one individual inside City Hall at the time of the blast, and that was its janitor, Leslie Graham. Busy at work, he said the explosion scared the, well, we'll just say hell, out of him. He would be the only one to sustain any injuries when a flying plank struck him in the ankle. He said he didn't hear anything leading up to the blast, but said he'd been near the entrance door just a short distance from where the bell was located, only minutes earlier. The case was treated as an instance of domestic terrorism and was definitely something law enforcement wanted to solve, as well as something the public was clamoring for them to solve. 
Four young white men with shaggy, shoulder-length hair were seen leaving the area and climbing into a foreign-made vehicle, which was later reported to be a white Volkswagen bus with California license plates. A witness said the bus had been circling the block around City Hall only minutes before the blast. Discovering who they were became the focus of the early investigation. Due to their appearance and the vehicle they drove, this group of men were quickly classified as hippies, which alone was a term many people associated with protesters and troublemakers. This was an easy direction for everyone to go in, and it also synced with the feelings and attitudes of that time. 1970 was a fairly tumultuous year for America, but in particular for the state of Oregon. Anti-war sentiment with regards to our involvement in Vietnam was escalating and reached a fevered pitch on May 4, 1970, when four students at Kent State University were killed during a protest of the war at the hands of the Ohio National Guard. These events only bolstered anti-war sentiment, especially on America's college campuses. This included protests by students at Portland State University, in downtown and only blocks away from City Hall. After several days of protesting in downtown, on May 11, 1970, Riot police attempted to disperse the protesters, and when some refused to leave, the orders were given to charge at those remaining. These people were violently attacked, with more than 30 of them ending up hospitalized. Another instance of civil disobedience being met with brutality. These events were captured visually and memorialized in the student-produced film The Seventh Day. The day after this violence, thousands of people, both for and against the protests, marched to City Hall to further protest the savagery that had occurred. After this, in later August, with the American Legion having an annual convention in Portland, which would include then-President Richard Nixon attending, there was concern that thousands of anti-war protesters might descend on the city. To counter this, a planned-out rock music festival, iconically known as Vortex One, was scheduled for when this convention took place. The hope was to attract all these young hippies and war protesters away from the city and down to Milo McIver State Park in rural Clackamas County, many miles from Portland. In the end, Nixon ended up not showing, and Vortex One was considered a success as the protests that did occur in town during the American Legion Convention were smaller than otherwise expected. But the fact that people felt a whole rock festival was necessary to avoid serious civil unrest is just another indication as to how tense things were in the late summer of 1970, heading into the fall. Because of this, it should be of no surprise that investigative records showed the police primarily focused on people associated with outspoken left-wing groups. This included members of what was called the White Panthers, a group of white individuals who aligned themselves with the Black Panther Party. Despite being absolutely invaluable to their community, the Portland Black Panthers faced consistent blowback from the city. In fact, the week before Vortex won, a McDonald's in the heart of Portland's black community was itself bombed. Many eyes fell on the Black Panthers as being responsible, but nothing was ever proven. The event would serve as one of many that adversely affected the Panthers' stance in the city of Portland. Two weeks after the Liberty Bell bombing, on December 5th, the headquarters of Portland's White Panthers was raided by the FBI after two of their members were accused of throwing Molotov cocktails through the window of a Selective Services office. Suspicions about them in relation to the bombing may have also played a part in this raid happening. 
and bringing us back around to those four young men in the Volkswagen bus. The primary witness to them was shown several photographs by the police to see if they could identify anyone. These pictures were almost exclusively of people who had been involved in the Portland State protests months earlier. It also came to the authorities' attention that a similar bus had been seen near a logging camp close to Albany, Oregon weeks before the bombing. Around this same time, a guard at the camp was killed in a robbery that included dynamite being stolen from there. Some wondered if this dynamite may have been used in the Liberty Bell bombing. But when all was said and done, these young individuals were identified and they all were able to provide alibis and were abruptly dismissed as suspects. However, the events surrounding this dynamite robbery did raise some significant concerns. By this point, the state of Oregon had experienced several instances of explosives having been stolen. What made this interesting, as well as frightening, was the fact that explosives such as dynamite were readily available for purchase in the state of Oregon. Thus, going so far as to kill a man just to obtain some appears excessive. Unless, of course, one doesn't want the purchase of such goods to be tied back to them. Since those responsible for blowing Portland's Liberty Bell to pieces were never identified, part of the reason may have been that there was no way to tie the explosives that were used to them. Furthermore, caches of explosives were being found all over the state during this time from some 30 sticks being found under a log pile west of Salem, down to a few sticks found wrapped in an old newspaper in some bushes in someone's yard. Editorials in local papers clearly showed the public's concern about the ease with which people could obtain explosives, and even theorizing about future bombings. And this was all just a couple of weeks before the Liberty Bell was blown up. While there's nothing to suggest the events were related, ten days after this bombing on December 1st, sticks of dynamite were used to bomb Johnson Hall at the University of Oregon in Eugene. This was two months after another hall at the university had been bombed, in October. At this time, University of Oregon was a haven for staunch anti-war sentiment. While Considering the events of 1970, and previous years for that matter, it made sense for law enforcement to quickly suspect far-left or even possibly right-wing groups. This may have also blinded them to other possibilities. Granted, some of these other theories didn't make a whole lot of sense, such as one that suggested the bombing was a prank gone wrong. Considering the blasting power of the explosives used it's hard to believe the motive was so passive. Sure, a bombing right outside the main hub of a city's government does strongly imply a political or radical motivation, but there are other possibilities. In a rapidly forgotten wrinkle to this story, friends came forward to the police in the aftermath of the bombing, claiming a teenager they knew had taken credit for the blast. This kid was also known for experimenting with explosives. Investigation into him led all the way up to involvement by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. This testing was used to dismiss this teenager as a suspect. While this doesn't indicate guilt in this young man's case, it at least suggests the possibility that the bombing may have just been the work of someone fixated or even seasoned in the use of explosives. Perhaps it wasn't politically motivated at all and just the work of someone who wanted to make a splash and get some attention for their explosives expertise while doing their best to remain anonymous. The timing of this was also shortly after the workings of Portland's first major urban renewal project during the 1960s, which led to the displacement of many people. The northwesternmost corner of where this project occurred just happened to be diagonal across an intersection from 
City Hall. By the dawn of the 1970s, Terry Shrunk had been Portland's mayor for over a decade, and for all that had happened during that time, the mayor was not very popular among a lot of people. And despite trying to remove such things with this urban renewal project, the area around City Hall was a pretty rough area with plenty of crime to go around. A man named Tom Campbell, who runs a website called TomLovesTheLibertyBell.com, suggested another possibility in relation to Mayor Shrunk. Back in the 1950s, he was the sheriff of Multnomah County when the city's vice scandal broke, revealing how much power organized crime had had in the city. Despite these revelations, there's no reason to believe such crime just left the city altogether just because it was unveiled. And in the past, organized crime had functioned out of the area near City Hall and south of there, where a massive urban renewal project had taken place during the 1960s. Removing a large chunk of land where crime had been allowed to operate, just to be replaced by office buildings and high-rise apartments, may have left local criminals feeling threatened and shrunk as well as the city council, had been instrumental in pushing this urban renewal project forward. The theory then becomes, was some criminal element within the city responsible for this bombing as a way to threaten and or send a message to the city's mayor about his efforts to change the city? Considering the fact that the origins of Shrunk's support of urban renewal went back to the start of him being mayor in 1957, it seems unlikely an event like this wouldn't have happened until 1970. However, this urban renewal project may have just been one of many things frustrating people of Portland's criminal underworld with regards to Mayor Shrunk. There was no indication that Shrunk felt scared or like he was specifically targeted by the bombing. He would serve as the city's mayor until the start of 1973. Tom Campbell also pondered a rogue cop theory on the case. Reportedly, multiple officers who'd intentionally avoided making arrests of people at gambling houses were disciplined for their actions with the full support of the mayor. The thought then is that one of these officers may have become disgruntled enough that they wanted to do something to scare the mayor. Another possible motive that I haven't seen anyone suggest, and I'm by no means claiming this was the motive, relates to another project tied to the Portland Development Commission, the same group that ran the city's first major urban renewal project. This involved the expansion of the city's Emanuel Hospital, located in the heart of Portland's black community. Plans for this started way back at the start of the 1960s, ultimately calling for the removal of many locals from their homes to have land available for the expansion. Despite this, the first meetings allowing involvement by those who are going to be displaced did not happen until the summer of 1970. This caused a great deal of conflict, including the establishment of an organization called the Emanuel Displaced Persons Association, which fought back against the project. I'm not claiming members of this organization or even locals directly affected by this expansion project may have been responsible for this bombing, but I am at least suggesting the possibility that this project, which had reached its peak controversy around the time that this bombing happened, may have been a motivating factor for whoever was responsible to carry this bombing out. By this time, hundreds of families in Portland's black community had been displaced by projects such as the construction of the I-5 freeway and the city's Memorial Coliseum. And the Emanuel Expansion Project not only displaced even more people, but it also led to the demolition of a significant area of cultural significance around the Williams Avenue and Russell Street area. And the city's government had stood right behind all of this. While the guys in the Volkswagen bus were a dead end, along with the fact that nobody was ever arrested for the crime, 
Investigators were left very much in the dark from day one. No other individuals were noted as being near the scene when the bombing occurred, and no further persons of interest came forward. Such circumstances make it very difficult to establish a definite theory about what happened. And while I've suggested otherwise, for the sake of covering all possibilities, I feel the bombing was likely politically motivated and taken out either by members of a French group or at least an individual or individuals that shared the beliefs and sentiments of such groups. But that's just my perspective, hardly based on absolute fact. Absolute fact is something this case unfortunately never had going for it. Not then, and hardly now. Nobody knows exactly who was responsible for this act, and with the passing of the years, it's becoming less and less likely we will ever know.